succeeded because I, I we're, we're running out of daylight hours. Well, Harry, I think it's fairly easy to see from uh, my shooting against yours, you were brought up in a farming community. How big a part of your life has, has that been, the farming side? It was a huge part growing up, you know. Um, my mum and dad are both farmers. Uh, their family are, were, were farmers as well. So um, it was great growing up on a farm. I had a great childhood and um, I saw, saw lots of life. It's a tough environment as well at times. Now, how did it shape you in terms of where you've gone now? Yes, yeah, certainly. In, in farming, there are lots of lots of highs and there are lots of lows as well you know so uh, it was a good way to look at look at look at the highs and lows and accept accept the lows especially whoa oh shot you're clearly a very intelligent lad but how much did academia and academics play a part in your early childhood was it an importance for you or not um they spent a lot of money early on and sent me to a private school. Um, so I, I, I went and, and did what I had to do to get by, but I was more interested in the sport and uh, in, in the farming when I got home. There's a great story also about when you were supposed to be sitting one of your final exams. I don't know if it was English or maths, but you'd actually disappeared off to ride your first winner under rules. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I think it was my, my uh, English exam. I was meant to sit my English exam at school and uh, my first ride at Leicester. And, um, my mum called me on the way to Leicester in a bit of a temper because I, um, I missed my English exam. But uh, thankfully the horse won, it was a massive price and um, I, I never went back after that. One of the great influences in your life has been the great Ron Hodges. Uh, how did he come into your life? How did you build that relationship? And, and what did he do to, to bring you to where you are at this moment? Uh, Ron's very good uh, family friends of my grandparents and um, we were actually parked outside to Chinese one night and um, he was in the local restaurant and uh, he came out to say hi and um, we got talking about because I had a um, pony and whatnot and we got talking and he said oh we'll get you into pony racing now you're nine years old and I never really thought anything of it and I didn't think he'd uh, he'd do much about it but anyway next day he, he turned up at home and uh, saw me ride my pony and um, had my first pony race we didn't get on very well um, so I said, I said, it's all right, I enjoyed it, but I don't like finishing last. We need to get a faster horse. So he went and bought a, bought a new, new pony with my parents, and uh, she won lots of races, and that was probably what got me the bug um, for racing. At what point, though, did you decide racing and, and horses is going to be a professional career? I think from about the age of 10, I was... You know, I, I sat at home and watched racing on the weekends and, you know, the Gold Cups, the King Georges, we watched all of them and um, it was sort of Ruby and Corto that really, really inspired me because Paul Nichols is a local trainer to me and um, that was that was really what inspired me. Your first proper job within racing was with Anthony Honeyball. How did that come about? How much did he help develop you? I helped me a massive amount. You know, I, wanted, I always knew I was going to go to... Paul Nichols is at some stage because I rode out there from about the age of 13 but um, I wanted to learn a little bit more uh, get a little bit more streetwise before I went into the into the into the big yard so um, Anthony and Rachel really took me under their under their wing really and um, showed me the ropes they actually gave me a few rides and um, you know got me schooling well and uh, it was a, it was a it was a great stepping stone from Anthony's obviously the step was to go to Paul's how big a step was that and in any way was it daunting when you walk into a yard sort of that size and stature? I suppose when I left Anthony's and went to Paul's it wasn't too bad because I rode out there from, from the age of 13 so um, I knew Paul well, I went to school with his daughter Megan and I knew all the staff from, from riding out there in summer holidays and stuff but uh, yeah, it was obviously a, it was a huge opportunity to be a conditional jockey for, for Paul and um, I did work hard in the yard. I, I, I mucked out and, and rode the horses for two years um, and got a lot of rides in the time that I was there. So, um, you know, I was very, very fortunate to get some big Saturday rides when I was a claiming conditional jockey. You became champion conditional as well. In terms of a development, in terms of helping you to take that next step into the professional ranks, how, how important was it for you to be champion? Oh, obviously, it's a massive help. and. Um, you need to improve all the time as well. I, th I think when I was, when I first started out, I look, look back at myself now and I think, blimey, did I really ride like that? But um, you know, I, I think I'm still improving now. 
you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a massive part of it. It's been said that you have a, a devil say care attitude to riding and also maybe a sense of arrogance, but is that arrogance an important thing in, in, the, in the job that you're doing? I do care, but I don't dwell on things. You know, things that I can't change will never worry me. If I get beat on five favourites or win Canton tomorrow, and, I've, and I know I've done my best, tomorrow's forgotten about. You know, I, I think, I suppose I'm just fairly realistic. I never worry about too much. What happens, happens. And as long as you know you've, you've done your best and you've tried hard, then, then that's the main thing. Here's the last on a long stride and brilliant surname is running right away from some really good horses here. You had a huge decision to make at a young age. There was two big yards vying for you to become stable jockey, obviously Paul and obviously Colin Tizard as well. What was going through your mind at that point? Oh, it took me, it took me a, a month to probably decide what I was going to do. I, I didn't really get myself worked up about it. But um, obviously, when you're 19 years old, it's a massive decision to make. So, um, yeah, I, I thought about it a lot. And Paul has obviously done a lot for me. But the, the current season, I rode nearly 50 winners for Mr. Tizard. So um, yeah, it was a huge decision. And, I decided to stick with Paul and, and, and still ride for Colin. I still go in there riding out for him every week. And, um, you know, Colin's still a big supporter of mine. We get on really well and he's been a massive help. After Ruby had left, other people came in and tried and failed is perhaps not the right word, but found it hard to fill those shoes. What did you do differently, if anything? To be honest with you, I don't think I really did anything different. Um, you know, the boys that were there before me rode lots of winners, did extremely well. Um, and Paul's champion trainer when, when they were riding for him. But uh, I suppose when, when Ruby came out of, uh, out of Ditch It, the good horses were on their way out. Corto Star, Big Bucks, Denman. Masterminded, yeah. Uh, There's so many. So they were sort of in a transition period, if you like, where new horses were coming through and we didn't really have any big guns at the time. Um, but the last sort of two years, we've got, some, we've got some really nice horses coming through and I suppose if you're getting the results, it makes your, makes your life a lot easier as a jockey. Was the timing, do you think, right for you? The fact that it was a transitional period, it was, was the pressure off a little bit? I suppose, yeah, we had, a, we, had a, we had a flying start last year. You know, we had a lot of good horses come out early and had a lot of winners and a lot of success. So um, when everything goes right, it makes your job a lot easier. Now, you, things started really well with Paul, but then you hit another major bump in the road. There was a bad day at market raising that must have given you some food for thought just talk us through that day yeah um i was riding a horse around market raising and got unseated at the last it was only a very soft fall but i landed on my neck um turns out i broke two vertebrae in my neck so i um i had a long time off spent a lot of time in a neck brace in the summer which wasn't ideal is it true that one of the surgeons at the time suggested that you may never ride again yeah one of the surgeons said i may never ride again and um Obviously, it was a blow after getting a big job, but um, it's like anything, you've got to be realistic. And I was fairly determined I was going to heal right and, and get back riding. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a worrying time, I suppose, for a couple of weeks. How difficult is it mentally to get back into competitive racing when, you, when you've suffered an injury like that? <sighs> to be honest with you, um, my first ride back, I felt very ropey. I felt unfit. As much fitness you can do in the gym, it's nothing compared to the real thing. So um, my first ride back, I didn't feel very stable at all. But then I think I had seven rides the next day at, at, at Chepstow. So um, I really got back into the swing of it. I think I rode three winners and uh, got the hunger, got the hunger back in me. And I was just determined to do really, really well. How exciting is, is Ditch It now as a yard to be riding for with, with the quality of horses that you have? Oh, it's, it's an amazing place to be, you know. I skip into the yard every morning, look at the board, and you see well over 100 horses getting ridden out every day, and um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a joy to be in the place, you know. Um, last year was absolutely fantastic. I came back from an injury, rode 109 winners. It, the atmosphere is fantastic. and. It's really enjoyable. Paul, as we know, is all, all about winning, but as a man and, and you're your boss, what, what is he like to work for? He's very hard, but he's very fair. Um, I think now, when I, when I first started, obviously he didn't trust me very much and different, different things like that. But uh, now I think he, I think he trusts me. Um, 
practices. You, you know what you're doing, so we, we, we don't overcomplicate things. We keep it as simple as we can. And uh, I think that's the key to success, really, not overcomplicate it. King George is a highlight for any jockey. Let's talk about Clem Desbo. Was it always thought of in the yard that he was a natural King George horse? Funnily enough, uh, he was actually 16 to 1, and we ran Politolog in the race as well, which is a 6 to 1 favourite, I think. And um, I, rode, I rode him in the Betfair Chase three or four weeks before, and uh, I thought he'd improve for it. He had a little glow going to three out, but he ran really well. You know, I, I was quietly very, very confident going out to ride him. I had nothing to lose because nobody else really fancied him, but uh, and, 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 and he delivered the goods on the day, so it was really satisfactory that we got the job done. So the natural progression for somebody like you one day would be to aspire to be champion jockey. How realistic an ambition is it? Well, obviously, if you want to become a champion jockey, you've got to ride. You've got to probably ride more horses than anywhere else, and you've got to ride a lot of lot of winners. Um, and you ride a lot of bad horses when you become champion jockey. You know, Richard Johnson is an inspirational man. He wins on the worst horses in the worst races, and he wins on the best horses in the best races. So. You know, he's really the Iron Man. I suppose I'm a good 60, 70 winners off of him looking at last year's tally, so I'd have to ride a lot more horses. Um, but you know, it's something I'd like to do one day. Um, it's realistically not possible when Dickie Johnson's about, but uh, yeah, it's something I'd, I'd like to do. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Thank you good very luck. much.